So Richard, uh, first of all, I think obviously the, the topic of today is the challenge um, of politicising multicultural Australia and how to overcome it. So I think we'd just start with from that general basis. Do you think that multicultural Australia is being politicised at the moment? If so, how and why? I do. Uh, can I just firstly just to say thank you to Affinity for the invitation to come along today. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning and obviously following in some very esteemed company. So it's a, it's, a, it's a great privilege for me to be here, also to acknowledge my parliamentary colleague, Jenny Leong. Um, I'm not sure if Tamara is here. Um, and uh, just acknowledge that we are on Aboriginal land on a pay respects to elders past and present. Um, multiculturalism is being politicised here in Australia, but I think it's also important to take a step back and recognise that this is not unique to Australia that this is something that's happening right across the world, uh, that if you look to recent events in obviously the US with the election of Donald Trump, if you look at what's happened uh, with Brexit, if you look at the rise of nationalism in Europe, that we're witnessing something that's not confined to Australia. Uh, we'd like to think, I think the, the thing that's most challenging for many of us here is that you often think these battles are won, and Australia being such a successful multicultural nation, the most successful multicultural nation on earth, and the stories of people in this room, uh, why we are such a successful and prosperous multicultural nation. And I think many of us have assumed that the sort of politics of division and fear were behind us. Um, so you, you have to ask yourself the question, what's going on and why is it happening? I think the first thing to say is there still is a lot of support amongst the community for multiculturalism. If you look at the number of published surveys, the Scanlon Foundation, a, number, a lot of the work that's being done through election surveys and so on, there's, there's still huge support for multiculturalism. But there's no question that, um, that some, some of that support um, has dropped off and indeed people are raising concerns about things like immigration, numbers of people coming here, s focus on specific groups. Um, so why is it happening and why is it being politicised? I suppose the first thing I'd say is th there will always be people in a community who will fear difference and will um, be susceptible to people who are prepared to inflame that difference. But why is that happening right now? And I think is, that's a bigger question. Why is it happening around the world? And I suppose my analysis, and I think this is um, the analysis that you'll hear supported by a number of people who have looked at this, is that when you have inequality, when you have economic inequality, when you have structural inequality in a society, you create the conditions that allow that to, um, you, that allow racism to thrive, that allow the politics of fear and division to thrive. And so I suppose at the heart of this is an acknowledgement that we need to start to tackle those underlying factors. You've got to deal with the fact that right around the world people are sick of um, a, a politics that has delivered rising economic inequality. And it's in that environment that you get political leaders who are, um, rather than acknowledging the real reasons for that are using um, the politics of fear and difference to further their own political agendas. So here in Australia we've got One Nation. One Nation um, haven't just happened in a vacuum. You know, we saw the rise of One Nation through the 90s. They've come back again and they've come back again in an environment where people are rejecting, I think, the, the, a politics that has delivered s significant inequality. So the challenge for us is how do we, how do we stop that? What do we do to, um, to counter that? And I think that, that requires two things. It requires firstly a focus on calling it out and I'm sure we'll get to that in a moment. The last week in Parliament was just, it was a disgraceful, shameful episode in the nation's history and it was actually encouraging um, that we saw you know, a really strong response from the community and, and a belated response from some of our politicians. Um, but we also have to address that issue of economic inequality. And I think until we do that, until we 
uh, deal with those structural factors, then we're going to continue to see people exploit it as they are right around the world. So to pick, a, <coughs> excuse me, to pick you up on the economic inequality, um, so w what do you suggest the answer is on that front? Because I think it sort of uh, plays into this whole migration debate that mm. we're seeing at the moment when people have quite legitimate concerns about overdevelopment and congestion and they seem to want to bl blame the, the, the migrants coming to our country. So how do we have that conversation without it straying into those uh, um, themes of xenophobia and, and racism? So what, what you've seen over the last 30 years is you've seen a, a politics that says if we hand over a lot of control to corporate influences, to corporations, then you know, we cut taxes, we privatise, we deregulate, um, we restrict the role that unions play in society, that everyone's going to be better off. And what, what that's delivered is it's delivered the privatisation of essential services, it's delivered a politics where politicians don't plan anymore, they don't plan when it comes to transport, housing, all of the things that create pressures within communities. So when you get that happening, you end up with people resenting the fact that you've got congestion, that people can't uh, deal with putting a house over their head, that they can't um, find work. Uh, so, you, so what is it that you do about that? Well, you have to, I think, and, and this is what's going on, just not, not just here, as I said, but right around the world. People are challenging that economic model. They're saying, look, we're sick of trickle-down economics. Um, we can do one of two things, and you're seeing this, I think, this polarisation occur. You can either focus on the fact that you've had decades of corporate influence in this idea that what's good for big business is automatically going to be good for people, um, or you can challenge that and start to recognise that what we've got to do is plan for the future, and what that means is putting the needs of communities front and centre, not putting the needs of corporations front and centre. What does that look like? Well, I suppose the first thing I'd say is, and, and I know this might, might sound unrelated to the issue of racism and multiculturalism, but when you've got huge money flowing to political parties from corporations, that's going to deliver a politics that's in their interests. So you've got to stop massive donations that flow to political parties. You've got to deal with rules around lobbying. You've got to have national anti-corruption watchdogs. You've got to do all of those things so they actually change the way politics operates in Australia. When you do that, you start to get a, a, a politics that delivers for people, not, not for corporations. And when you do that, what you end up with is a politics that says, for example, um, when it comes to housing, we're not going to allow people who buy their fourth or fifth home um, a huge tax deduction and make it harder for people who are trying to buy their first home when you've got a, a politics that delivers for people and not for big corporate interests, you end up with an investment in public transport rather than privatising our road infrastructure. When you've got a politics that does that, you actually start to invest in um, an energy system that reduces prices for people and deals with the problem of climate change rather than what we've got at the moment, which is our energy policies written by the coal lobby. So even though those things might seem like they're, they're somehow removed from the debate around multiculturalism and race, it's really important to bring those things together. Because what people like Hanson and Trump do is they recognise that there is anger within the community, that there's resentment within the community, that people are sick of this, as I said, this economic inequality, this lack of planning, lack of investment in infrastructure, lack of investment in schools and hospitals. They, they know that's how people are feeling. And what they do is rather than um, acknowledging the cause of that, they blame, they tap into, into race, latent racism within communities and they blame foreigners, they blame immigrants. And so that's what I think you're seeing happening right across the world and certainly here in Australia. So I think our challenge is twofold. It's one, to call it out. And two, it's actually to start to address the, the, the things that are, allow racism in society to flourish. And until we do that, you're still going to have an environment where people like Trump 
and in Australia, Hanson and, and, and the, the Liberal Party um, now use race uh, as, as a way of exploiting people's fears within, within our communities. So I suspect you're saying there that, that that's the politician's job to do that, or is it everyone in the community? Because uh, those ideas of federal ICAC, donations reform, I think a lot of voters would p probably agree with that. But it's obviously vested interests and, and that kind of thing that makes politicians hesitant to change yeah. it. I mean, let's be honest. So, I mean, I is there a responsibility on, 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 on the general public to make their voices heard as well? I mean, is it that, is it as that easy? You've got to do both. You have to do... I mean, like, the one thing I've learnt doing this job <laughs> um, uh, is that politicians in Canberra don't... They don't lead, they follow. And they need to be dragged to positions kicking and screaming. So, you know, look at the marriage equality debate. Um, public opinion was overwhelmingly in support of it. And it took, you know, a, a process which we didn't support, but a loud and resounding you have to do this from the community to drag them over the line. Um, so that communities absolutely need to have their voices heard. No question about it. And there needs to be as much pressure on the political class as possible because communities working together, organising, lobbying, making sure their um, voices are heard with, through their local MPs. Uh, otherwise, this stuff just doesn't happen. So you know, from our perspective, we're trying to show that leadership in Canberra um, our advocacy, for example, for a national anti-corruption watchdog has been successful in helping to drag Labor to that position. Liberals, not yet. Um, but we need, it needs to be a joint effort. You don't achieve anything in Canberra uh, unless, uh, unless communities are driving it and driving it hard and, and we're working together to make it happen. So just to pick up on a couple of things that's happened in the Senate uh, in particular this year, we, we saw the Fraser Anning um, speech earlier in the year invoking the final solution. And then obviously this week, as you mentioned earlier, the Pauline Hanson motion about it's okay to be white. Now, why do these things sort of, I think for the general public, why are these things even debated in our Senate? Mm -hmm. And um, and, but on the other hand, pe perhaps there is a section of society who would agree with those sentiments. And then, I guess, how do you debate it? Mm. So, I mean, clearly, Pauline Hanson has m built a political career on exploiting people's fears around racism. Now, I think there's a segment of her voting base who are just racist and they'll always be racist. I don't think we can um, shift them. But I do think that... That's only a, a proportion of people who support Pauline Hanson. I think there's another group who support her who are just fearful of change and are worried about all the things I mentioned earlier. Um, our job is to talk to that community, to say, we share your fears, and we do. We, part of the reason we're here, Jenny and myself, is because we see that economic inequality, we see this politics that's being influenced by big vested interests, and we understand why people are angry about it. Um, but our challenge is to direct that anger not at their neighbours, not at people who have helped to build Australia and make it the country that it is. I mean, look, I feel this stuff pretty personally. You know, it's part of my story, it's part of Jenny's story, it's all of the people in this room. And so I feel it very personally. But it's also important to understand where they're coming from and why they're reacting in that way. Um, so I think that's part of the challenge. But what's happening is as that politics is being played out, what you're seeing as a Liberal Party losing support to One Nation and rather than taking, taking her on, and it's clear there's a, there's a huge split in the Liberal Party in terms of how to respond to this. And you saw a play out with uh, It's OK To Be White. I don't know, I'm sure people followed this, but um, the It's OK To Be White motion that was passed in the Senate on the surface might seem innocuous to some people, but it's got a very long tradition in the white supremacist movement. That's something that, you know, um, it's been a sort of catch cry for the Ku Klux Klan and others. So it's really important to understand the context of where this stuff comes from. And you could see the tension within the Liberal Party saying, well, we can't not vote for it because if we don't, Pauline Hanson's going to exploit it and we're already losing votes to Pauline Hanson. And then you had other people, more moderate people, inside the Liberal Party saying, no, we, 
we just simply can't support this. And, um, and that, that um, split is playing out. You saw it um, when Pauline Hanson wore the burqa into Parliament. And I think if we'd had, I mean, George Brandis was somebody whose politics I didn't agree with on many things, but on that one he got it absolutely right. If we'd had a different person in the Senate, I don't know that we would have got that response. So I suppose our job um, as politicians and our job as a community is to try and encourage those voices within the Liberal Party to speak out um, and to do everything we can to make sure that um, they understand that you don't defeat one nation by adopting their worldview, which is what seems to be happening is that it's a sort of pyrrhic victory if one nation end up um, being unsuccessful but their legacy is that many of their policies and approach to multiculturalism is adopted by one of the governing parties and that's, that's a huge failure. So I think that's the politics at the moment in terms of the, um, the huge fight that's going on within, within the Liberal Party and I suppose our challenge is call it out as we did when that debate happened and encourage people, sensible people, more moderate people on all sides to try and speak up and have their voices heard. It's interesting that in the aftermath of both those um, episodes, the Fraser Anning and the Pauline Hanson um, speeches or motions, that uh, it really drew the Parliament together in terms yeah. of their condemnation. Um, I mean, it's kind of ironic that you needed something so extreme to pull everyone together. together but in some sense, is that, does that, is that heartening for you? Yeah, and I think, as I said, I, that was why the, the Pauline Hanson motion this week was so disappointing is because it actually, rather than everybody just coming out right from the start and saying, sorry, you can't do this, um, that, that I think was why so many people w w were so upset. It is heartening, but as I said, the flip side is the Liberal Party haven't decided what they're where they stand on this. They have not yet made a clear collective decision to say, we're going to call it out, we're going to take a stand against it, and so we end up with where we are at the moment. Every now and then, so I don't know, again, just it's been a pretty tough week. Um, just yesterday, Fraser Anning introduced a bill to restrict migration to Australia, I'm not sure if people saw this, um, to Europeans. If you're not European, you shouldn't be allowed to come to Australia. Now, at least what we saw with that, because it was so clear, was condemnation from everybody. We all agreed um, we were going to um, not even allow that bill to be debated, and it was basically dismissed. So, you know, when there's a step that's so egregious, you do get that response, but you can still see that that. Um, debate playing out within within the Liberal Party. And I guess on the flip side of that, by not allowing that debate, do you then further alienate those people and their supporters? No, because I think on that one it's, it's just so egregious that it doesn't warrant debate. I think there is, I mean, we are, and we are, whether we like it or not, there is a debate that's going on around what our country looks like, immigration numbers, and how we respond to that, and that's going to continue because um, I think it's look. I think it's a legitimate debate. The problem I've got is that most of it's being used as a way of sending very subtle and often not so subtle messages to um, some of the people who I've just described earlier. Some of them whom are, whom are racist, and some who just are fearful about what the future holds. Our job is to continue to focus on the problem and the problem isn't people coming to Australia, it's governments not investing in the foundations that allow cities to flourish and societies to prosper. Doesn't matter whether we restrict migration or not to Australia, if you keep stripping money out of your schools and hospitals, if you keep under investing in transport system, if you keep treating housing like it's some commodity, people are going to continue to be under pressure. So. This isn't a function of migration. This is a function of governments abrogating their responsibilities to plan cities and plan for the future, to deal with economic inequality, to ensure that we've got a society that supports people. So 
That's our challenge. So we've got to be really careful in the way we have the debate. And I'm always, you know, I'm all, my radar's always up whenever this comes up because you know that often the subtext is one that's, you know, sending messages to people. Um, if it's a genuine debate, let's have it and let's make sure that people um, are clear about what the problem is. And I'm pretty clear about it. So just on that debate, where do, do the Greens stand on it? Should migration be restricted or, or limited or, or brought down? Well, there's always... I mean, there are always limits on migration. doesn't matter who's in government. The people are always um, uh, going to determine how many people um, come to Australia. The question that we're really debating is, uh, should we reduce migration because um, our cities can't cope? And the answer to that question is no. The reason our cities can't cope is not because we've got, we're bringing in people from around the world, it's because governments aren't planning. Now that doesn't mean you can't have a conversation about what's your, what should a migration program be based on. And now we, we think it's really important to have a skills-based migration program to actually deal with um, the issue of Australia as global citizens and responding to um, the fact that we've got a, a refugee crisis and we've got a global refugee crisis, one that's only going to get worse, by the way, um, not better. And as you see what some of the projections look like when it comes to climate change, what we're seeing at the moment is really just a, a fraction of what, what is coming. So what's our responsibility as global, as global citizens? We want to increase our humanitarian in, intake as part of the uh, refugee, as part of the um, migration program. Um, and, I, and that, that's the sort of debate I want to have. What is, what is our migration program founded on? What are the principles on which we're basing it? Um, skilled migration, family reunion, uh, humanitarian intake that meets our responsibilities, global citizens. And let's keep the conversation about um, how we plan and build our cities and infrastructure. Let's keep that separate because that is a, that is a conversation that, that regardless of whether we stopped bringing people in tomorrow, people are going to continue to have pressures on them if governments don't do what they're elected to do. Um, yeah, I think that's... Yeah, so, so just to pin you down on <coughs> that, so you, in, um, you wouldn't like to see the migration numbers change, you'd prefer to see them increase, is that fair to say? I, I, I don't think that you, you say at one point in time, our numbers need to be decreased or increased because they're always changing. Every year they change. They change based on the need of our skilled migration program and so on. I think we've broadly got it right. So broadly I think what we've got at the moment is we've got it right. I think we would alter the mix. We'd increase our humanitarian intake as a proportion of our total intake. But if the question you're asking me is should we reduce our migration intake because of the pressures that people are feeling in our capital cities? The answer is no, because that's actually, that's the wrong diagnosis for the problem. The problem, the, the, the right diagnosis for the problem is a very different one. It's actually get your infrastructure right, plan. Um, migration has been the reason Australia is one of the most wealthy, developed countries on earth. Like we're living, <laughs> you know, you, you um, the reason Australia is so successful is because of the contribution of families from right, acro right across the world. That's the reason we are who we are. It's the reason as a, as a country with a tiny population compared to um, the rest of the world, we're so successful, you know, across so many endeavours. It's because of migration, not despite it. And you only need, to, I mean, even the Treasury's own papers on this, people talk about, well, Peter Dutton, does he, talk, he thinks that migrants do, they take our jobs, but they also have people living on, on the dole. So I couldn't quite work out the logic in that. He's, I think his attack um, is, you know, <laughs> we're bringing too many people over, they're taking our jobs and they're sitting on dole queues. So work that out if you're, the logic in that. But the government's own modelling shows that migration is a net benefit when it comes to employment. Migrants create jobs. They create a better community for all of us. So um, my, you know, my, my strong response to that is 
it's a huge positive for Australia. It's made us who we are. It's not just an economic benefit, by the way. It's actually in terms of who we are. The soul of the country is one that is enriched because of the contribution of people from right around the world. You know, you often have this debate Oh, you know, people need to come here and they need to adopt our values. And that completely misunderstands what multiculturalism is. It's actually the fact that our values are, because we're a multicultural nation, that's where they come from. We learn from each other, we listen to each other, and, and we're, the sum of all of that is much bigger than the individual parts. And, and it makes us who we are. And so just following up from that, before I open it up to the, the audience here, um, what's, what are the Greens doing to make sure that your party is reflective of the community and has representatives from the multicultural Australia? It's a good question. And I think the criticism of the Greens in the past has been, oh, well, you're, you, you don't represent um, the multicultural communities in terms of... Um, you know, the people who you elect. I suppose look at me and Jenny for a start. <laughs> Both of us from a different multicultural backgrounds. Uh, I look at, I suppose I can talk to our federal party room and we've just elected the first uh, female Muslim uh, to the federal Senate. We're very proud of that. Uh, I look at Victoria and in Victoria our party is led by a Sri Lankan woman. Um, we've just welcomed in a woman from a Vietnamese refugee background. We've just elected the first Aboriginal woman to the Victorian Parliament. So in terms of representation, we're really, um, I think, representing... We have a party now that represents the f diversity of the Australian community, and we're very proud of that. Um, how, how did we get there? Well, again, I can talk to you about the experience um, in my uh, home state. We've just established a fellowship program which involves mentoring young people from multicultural backgrounds. We've got a lot of, one of the hard things about politics is, even if you want to get involved, a lot of people don't know how to get involved. It's like a bit of a black box to people. There's no sort of obvious pathway. And so one way to do that is to, um, we've run this program that says, if you're interested in getting involved, we, we have a, a structured fellowship program um, supported by a number of groups, including um, the Islamic Council of Victoria, uh, and we, we run this structured program, we, we've got huge diversity in terms of the people who attend, people from a range of backgrounds, and um, they mentored and they graduate with a really deep understanding of how they can be involved, whether it's through party politics or just engaging through the political process. And I've got to say, one of the proudest things for me as a leader was going in and awarding the graduation um, at the graduation ceremony and just coming into a room of, I don't know, it was 100 odd people and it was, it was fantastic. It was like, you know, it was like the United Nations. It was just wonderful. African people, um, people of different faiths, uh, just huge diversity. Um, so that's one of the things we're doing. We've set up an advisory council uh, where we're, for example, we've got a, um, an advisory council of um, uh, people from a, a variety of different religious traditions. So we have a Jewish Greens network that we talk to um, when there are con uh, issues that are, are difficult issues um, uh, coming up. We've got a, a Muslim advisory council set up. So we do all of that. Um, and I suppose one of the, one of the heartwarming things is now that some of that work is starting to translate into recognition from those different communities that we are an ally. And so we, I spend a lot of time at functions like this talking about that work that we're doing and encouraging people to get involved. That's fantastic. I have many more questions, but I should open it to the audience. So if anyone is, is happy to have a, ask Richard a question. 